All right, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our call. This is the Smart Manufacturing Tech Topic Series. Um, today's speaker is uh, Rashan Nanu from uh, Idomatic, and he's going to be talking about supercharging the industrial workforce by combining domain knowledge and AI. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to let you all know that you are on mute, and if you do have questions during the session today, I would ask that you please type those into the chat window. We'll be collecting them and asking them at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, we do have some other folks that are monitoring the chat, so if you do ask a question, it might get answered in the chat as well. Um, so feel free to, to ask those questions at any time, and I'll be gathering those. Um, just to let you know, um, this is a series uh, that we're doing. This is the second in the series that I've run. There actually is another series that um, Hailey Fu, another project manager, is also running um, that's part of this. Um, and all our speakers are talking about various interesting areas to smart manufacturing. So um, Itomatic is going to talk about AI and, and how that relates uh, to smart manufacturing, and, and all our speakers do similar kind of activities. Again, the, the uh, chat function is there for you to ask questions. There isn't a QA and a uh, function set up. I would ask you please use the chat and everybody is muted. Um, if you need to, you can use your raised hand function and I will try to uh, get to your question as quick as I can. Um, in terms of the presentation, it'll be sent out about a week after the session is over. We are recording the session. I just started that a few a minute or two ago. Um, and we are also working on making an FAQ based on the questions that we heard this morning and any additional questions that we have today. And so we'll make sure that all that gets distributed out. Um, and lastly, um, here is some basic contact information for uh, Roshan and Nick from Itomatic and well, as well as myself. I'll also put this in the chat window for you uh, for those that need it. But you're not here to hear from me today. You're here uh, to hear from Roshan. So let me uh, close my camera and turn it over to him. Thank you very much. Introduction, Mark. And uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rashan, and I'm happy to be talking to you today on supercharging the industrial workforce with uh, generative AI and domain knowledge. Um, so just a little bit about me, so you know where I'm coming from uh, in talking about all of this. I actually started working with AI back in 2009. We were coding up, you know, small perceptrons by hand. Um, and I got a bachelor's in physics from Caltech, moved on to a master's in neuroscience and cognition, and then a PhD in neuroscience. Um, and throughout that entire journey, I've been working in a number of labs applying AI to different areas of research. Um, and then for the past two years, I've been working at Idomatic applying AI to industrial use cases for uh, use cases such as smart homes, predictive maintenance, process optimization, and more recently heading up our product development at Itomatic, working with generative AI to bring new tools to industrial customers to accelerate their digital transformations. Um, if at any point uh, you wanna reach out to me after the talk, um, please feel free to send me an email or you can scan this QR code to, to take a look at my business card. Um, but let's just jump right into this. So today I'm going to walk you through um, really the impact that AI will have on smart manufacturing. First, talking about generative AI a little bit and how it stands to transform the industry. But then I want to take you a little deeper beyond the hype of ChatGPT and LLMs to understand their real limitations the challenges to implementing these within industry companies, and really how to overcome those challenges and what the future of the landscape looks like. And as a lot of you know, right now in electronics manufacturing, especially, and in semiconductor manufacturing, there's a huge opportunity in the landscape. Right now, the US is passing bills to try and drive funding towards semiconductor development within the US. China is doing something similar, and so is Taiwan. A lot of different countries and governments are actively funding projects to bring semiconductor manufacturing into their country, but also to innovate that manufacturing, bring factories up to the digital age. 
Um, so right now, there is a time of unprecedented opportunity in the landscape for digital transformations. That said, there's still a lot of reticence behind those digital transformations. I mean, key industry leaders, such as Morris Chang and Elon Musk, actively think that, you know, moving chip manufacturing into the US is a waste of time or that it's a misallocation of capital. And this is pretty much because there's a lack of talent and expertise, not just in the US, but, but in the world. A lot of our customers at Itematic are, are facing the issue where their workforce is aging and retiring. And that means all of their best, most experienced workers are leaving and taking their decades of knowledge and experience with them leaving the company poorer for it and they're just starting to realize that that knowledge that experience is really where their value lies so the question is how to overcome that gap and how to overcome that crisis because overcoming that is what will allow companies to really jump forward in the manufacturing space over the next decade because right now you have thousands of workers at any given manufacturing factory, but only a small handful with the expertise to repair the equipment or with the expertise to optimize the processes. And these few people are in high demand by everybody else, but they can't possibly scale across your entire plant or system. So that is where tools like generative AI come in. They are tools that stand to help overcome that hurdle. And really, it's only this year that generative AI has reached a level of maturity where it can actually be a benefit to the industry. Right? For those that aren't aware, generative AI refers to models like ChatGPT, which take natural language prompts from people or questions from people and then return and generate new content based on that, right? So ChatGPT can be used to generate whole documents just from a prompt saying you want a document about something. Or DALI, which is a generative adversarial network, is a model where I can ask it to make a photograph of a monkey in space, and it will make a very realistic photograph of a monkey in space. It's going to generate new art based on my query and my ask. And other tools are out there as well. LLMs are being used to code and create software just from defining your requirements. And it's this technology that will help overcome that gap of domain expertise within companies. So with smart manufacturing today, it will start to look like taking the expertise from all of your veterans, from all of your company's history, and leveraging generative AI systems to democratize that expertise and knowledge across your entire workforce, right? Which means generative AI will primarily, and if you take nothing else away from this, this, this talk, is that generative AI primarily will be used to increase productivity in every sector. So you can ask, you know, this is ChatGPT. You can ask ChatGPT to make documents and have those write-ups take seconds instead of hours. You can ask it to make code and without being an expert in code, suddenly have algorithms and software that you can run. And this will start to infiltrate every step of the value chain. With AI creating new art, it's a small step further to start creating new designs, right? Designs of circuit board layout, designs of new chips, designs for new products. Furthermore, it can be used to generate data sets to test those designs on. And AI will be used to simulate those tests and run those experiments. And it'll take months of R&D work down to a day or two. On the manufacturing line, generative AI 
will start to go past just automation with robot arms carrying out a procedure to build your part, it will start to enable predictive maintenance on the manufacturing line where sensor data will be read in real time and systems will identify when they will fail and how they will fail before that happens. Ideally, far enough in advance that those systems themselves will be able to suggest the best way to diagnose, to, to fix that error, to submit the work order, to acquire parts to fix that error, to schedule the downtime needed to fix that error, and communicate with human operators to get their problem solved. Right In a smart warehouse, the layout of that warehouse will be decided by AI to be optimum for, for getting goods to where they need to go as fast as possible. Routes for delivery will be decided by AI. And so at every step along the way, generative AI will revolutionize the way it's done, not by replacing workers, but by taking each human and increasing the productivity they can have. Working with them. Right. McKinsey, a large consulting firm, did released a report this year on generative AI and the impact it'll have on, on all industries. Um, but a key takeaway from that for me was there were certain tasks that it was believed were the realm of humans and that computers would be unable to do that for 50, 60, 100 years. And now with the advent of generative AI and the maturity it reached this year, those timelines have gone down from 50 years to five to 10 years, right? Within the next five to 10 years, we will see AI able to effectively coordinate among multiple agents and people to get tasks done. We will see it apply creativity and logic and problem solving in way at levels equivalent to humans within the next five years. And in fact, tasks that were previously thought to be unautomatable are suddenly very probable to be automated within the next five to 10 years, right? Such as applying domain expertise to tasks or managing groups to complete tasks. Those are suddenly very feasible with generative AI. And what that means is that in smart manufacturing, you'll see a lot of new use cases pop up every day. Some of the ones that I know are popping up now are generative design, where AI is being used to create and iterate on designs at a rapid pace. Our layout optimization of manufacturing lines and new facilities of manufacturing optimization of processes to streamline the whole workflow, to get rid of the need for people to think and remember all of the exact right optimal process settings. For predictive performance and predictive maintenance modeling, and for fault detection and diagnosis. Right, in these systems, we'll be accelerating field service engineers in their diagnosis of, of failures and their treatment of those failures and the generation of the report after those failures or after that maintenance and everything will become very connected. That said, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, this is the company that is kind of behind all of the hype right now. They created and released, you know, ChatGPT and GPT-4, which are large language models that have really taken the world by storm. Even Sam Altman is saying that the age of giant AI models is already over. Um, so despite all of these capabilities of AI, the age of giant AI models is already over. Right, the age of ChatGPT and GPT-4 is over because those models 
are insufficient to revolutionize industry and to be adopted by industry. Right? They have some very serious limitations. The most important of which is the huge resource cost. Right now, to run GPT-4 with its 1.7 trillion parameters, you have to have very specialized hardware. You have to have a stack of A100 GPUs, which I think are retailing somewhere around $80,000 a piece. You have to have those systems in place in order to just run the model. In order to train these models, you have to have those plus the immense data sets that were curated and collected over years. So right now, large language models can only be created and operated by a select few companies, leading to concerns of vendor lock-in and greatly limiting adoption of these technologies within industrial companies. Furthermore, these LLMs are trained on large public data sets, but lack domain-specific knowledge related to your particular company or your particular domain. And finally, LLMs aren't actually thinking or reasoning. What they're doing is emulating that reasoning by, you know, taking a statement and predicting the next most likely statement or way to complete that statement. And because of that, when you ask them a question that they actually don't have the information to answer, LLMs will still answer with complete confidence, leading to hallucinations or false answers. And those lead directly to safety and security risks. So for example, if I asked ChatGPT about a specific data set from a specific company's warehouses, it can't possibly know this answer. It doesn't have that information, but it will give me an answer that seems correct. And unless you're an expert in this system, you wouldn't know that this answer is wrong and you may take this information and use it in your daily activities. And that could lead to severe safety and security risks. Or if you ask it to create an algorithm that it doesn't know and it doesn't have the domain expertise to create, then it'll write failing code and set you back and you'll have to go and fix it. Now, these models are improving day by day, but they're not the answer. Despite these risks, um, our customers are going ahead with their own use cases and using generative AI to augment their workflows and to augment and to bring value to their industry. Um, we have a customer working with developing atomic layer deposition devices. And in order to help their customer out, they're using generative AI to create small specialized experts where they have their own knowledge base on their own equipment and are using LLMs to serve that knowledge to their customer or using generative AI systems. So their customers can open up these systems and use them to diagnose failures in the equipment that they're working with or quickly figure out what are the correct settings on the equipment in order to get the desired result based on what substrate they're using, based on the type of layering they want or the type of deposition they want. And this allows our customer to quickly scale up and scale out their pro productivity because now instead of having to have a dedicated veteran expert go and help onboard and help educate each and every customer, they have this system to help educate, onboard, and operate with, with every single customer. And their veteran experts have a lot more time to spend where they're most needed. Right? So when their customer is having low yield, they can work with this generative AI system to look at what the specific systems are. What are the correct problem-solving heuristics? What are the possible causes? and the reasoning to get to an answer, the system will work with them to do so. In another use case, a customer is working in boiler manufacturing and thus boiler maintenance for their customers. And their biggest issue is that their veteran engineers are retiring and taking their experience and knowledge on how to fix these problems with them. 
and their junior engineers don't have that expertise, don't have that experience. So every time they go to fix a problem, it takes them longer. It takes them multiple trips. And often they have to stop and call one of those veteran experts carving into their available time in order to diagnose a problem. Now what they've done is taken the expertise from those experts, taken their heuristics and know-how, and created virtual experts based on that knowledge using generative AI systems. And now those junior engineers, when they go face an issue in the field, they have a, a system and a visual that is directly connected to the alarm feed, that's directly connected to the data coming off of that boiler, and more importantly, that's directly connected to all of the know-how from those veteran experts on how to solve these problems. So working with the generative AI system called IVA, they are more quickly and more efficiently solving their problems without needing to bother the dwindling supply of veteran experts. Even in oil refinery operations, we're seeing generative AI being used today, where these AI systems are used to help advise plant operators and plant planners. Um, for operating these refineries and for optimizing the operation of these refineries on a day-to-day -day basis. With million dollar refineries, it's so hard to keep track of all of the different machinery and settings that need to be changed on a daily basis to maximize yield, to, to get the expertise in all of the different fields you need expertise in, in order to understand the equipment of that refinery and choose the best operating settings. Um, in order to take into account sustainability concerns and initiatives on how to reduce the carbon footprint, or how to account for the fact that your, your oil refinery is not operating at 100% because there are a dozen different defects at any given time. Um, now, with generative AI, the AI system can take into account all of those different factors and work with the refinery manager to very quickly and efficiently solve an, all their problems and take care of their tasks on a day-to-day -day basis. The AI helps determine what are the best settings and can justify that back to the users. It can reason through those problems. So now I know some of you are probably thinking, or whoops, sorry. Um, and all of that's done with actually our most recent product, IVA, which is Itematics Industrial Virtual Advisor, um, which is actually a system where companies are uploading their documents, their manuals, SOPs, and equipment manuals, as well as their expert feedback from their veteran experts into our generative AI system that can then directly work with planners, field service engineers, operators, in order to accelerate their workflows. But this system is not just an LLM. Rather than asking a single large omniscient language model to do all of these tasks, like be an expert in chemistry and you know, gas operation equipment and industrial boilers and centrifugal pumps, and also have that same LLM communicate with multiple different human experts or do problem solving and planning tasks. Instead of having one LLM try and take on all of those tasks, we've actually broken those tasks down into having small specialist models collaborating to solve these problems. And these models are really the way to overcome those challenges from LLMs earlier. If you remember, large language models are just the last in a long progression of bigger and bigger neural networks. But they've gotten to the point where they are extremely costly to train. 
And as soon as a new one comes out, you have to change your whole system to adapt to that new technology. So there's a high risk of obsolescence. There's a high risk of ownership because it's trained on data from the whole world and only a little bit of your you know, private data set. And you still don't even have the technology to train and run those models on your own anyway. And then there's still the risk of hallucination and safety because there are no checks and balances within a single large network. Instead, what we can do is actually create small specialist models. And the difference between these and large language models is partly size. Right, a small specialist model can be anything from a 7 billion parameter language model, which is still a thousand times smaller than GPT-4, down to just an algorithm or a heuristic or a set of rules. But these small specialist models, thanks to generative AI, are endowed with the ability to communicate with each other. So you can take your domain expertise as unstructured, raw knowledge and ingest it into these separate small specialist models and then have those models collaborate to solve your problems. And the best part is your company would 100% own each of these specialist models. In fact, the way the future is moving Companies value will be judged by the specialist models that they own. Those are in fact going to be the repository for all of their knowledge and information. Because no one has time to go read through 30 years worth of documents and maintenance logs. But an autonomous agent that has access to 30 years of, of maintenance logs and manuals and expertise and can serve that up whenever needed that is valuable that is what is what will be owned by by companies and rather than having to say send one of their veteran experts to one customer they can provide the same small specialist model to 100 customers that encapsulates all of the knowledge of that veteran expert all of the knowledge about their equipment or about their processes. Right? Our company actually has this as an open source project. So really anyone can go on here and start creating their own specialist models for their company. We help take that a step further um, and help those models collaborate. But even outside of Itematic, you see these specialist models popping up every single day with researchers at Stanford creating cheat models that can beat ChatGPT at conversation, Gorilla creating a model that can beat ChatGPT or GPT-4 at writing API calls, Microsoft unveiling a small model that can code better than ChatGPT. Every day, people are, are, are taking large language models and now pruning them and specializing them for different domains. And that specialization is the future of AI because those specialist models can very easily be upgraded, very easily be trained, and very easily be run, right? Some of these smaller language models I can run on my laptop. I don't need $80,000 hardware, which means I can run these models on prem if needed, and I don't need to send my data off-premises to the cloud at all, alleviating a lot of security concerns. Which means I directly own my models, alleviating ownership concerns. And it means that I can actually network my models together to get the behavior I need to run my manufacturing plants. Right, I can have a network of my small specialist models that are trained on my company's expertise and quality assurance in maintenance of my particular equipment, 
in my particular processes for semiconductor manufacturing and connect them to all of the sensors within my manufacturing plant and all of the actuators within my manufacturing plant and my control systems. And have that entire network work with my process engineers to very quickly solve problems and optimize my operations. Right? These systems are grounded in heuristics and facts, but they offer so much more. They offer human level reasoning and planning. And that really lets us get to industry 4.0, right? In the 60s, we started with automation, with robotic arms on manufacturing lines, replacing the need for workers on those lines. But now we're getting to the point of autonomy, where our AI systems and our industrial systems can not only work in an automated fashion to carry out repetitive tasks over and over again, but they can work in an autonomous fashion and communicate with human operators to get the best performance. So we're not getting to the point where AI is going to replace human operators. We're getting to the point where AI systems being in place doubles, triples, 10Xs the productivity of your human operators. And really with a talk like this, I don't quite have enough time to go into all of the depth that I want to. And I have, you know, about 20 minutes for some questions. But if beyond that, you want some more information on this topic and more information on how different companies and industries are actively using generative AI today. Um, in October, there's a conference coming up, uh, the K First World Symposium, where leaders from Panasonic and Patronus and Hitachi and more are getting together to talk about different ways in which their companies are applying industrial AI to revolutionize their processes, to revolutionize their industries. Um, our company happens to be a platinum sponsor of this conference, so we have some discounted tickets to, to basically hand out. Um, so if you're interested in going, um, please, please feel free to scan this QR code and um, I look forward to, to seeing you there. So I'll come back to this slide later, but um, with that, I'll happily take questions from whoever has any. Great. Thank you, Roshan. Uh, are there questions from anybody? Please uh, type them in the chat window or use the raised hand function and I'll uh, let you talk. OK, so here's one um, It says. The industrial process is very strict on decisions, actions, because a wrong or incorrect consideration may cause serious effects. However, ger generative AI is more about creative tasks. How to ensure the Avia system operates as a useful assistant? OK, that's a really great question. Um, I think I understood it, but do you mind repeating it just in case I, I missed something at the beginning of that? Sure. He says uh, the industrial process is very strict on decisions, actions, because a wrong or incorrect consideration may cause serious effects. However, ge generative AI is more about creative tasks. How to ensure that the AVS system operates as a useful assistant? Yes, that is a very good question. And actually one of the largest concerns I've seen out of people thinking to apply generative AI. Um, it is that, yes, these generative AI systems are not reliable enough. That said, with smaller and more specialized systems, um, it's possible to get that level of rely reliability, um, whereas large, ne uh, large language models, large models like GPT-4, 
are, you know, more about creative tasks. They have more of that creativity built in. Smaller models have less of that. And in fact, you can directly connect those small models to facts, to more traditional ML inferencing models, to databases, and make them comply and respond only with factual information. The second is with networks of small models, you can ensure validation before any information gets back to the user, right? I personally would have an expert in whatever field I'm working on, right? So if I'm working with industrial boilers, I'd likely have an expert in industrial stream boilers that's tied to a large database on industrial steam boilers, the physics, the operation, the models, as well as another expert that's tied to safety regulations and compliance to validate that anything that my steam boiler expert tells me is also safe and compliant with you know, regulations that are set down by my company or by regulatory boards in much the same way I regulate people today, except for the fact that my safety small specialist model wouldn't forget any safety precautions. It would have all of those at its fingertips and be able to use and apply all of those to verify that any output I'm dealing with as a human is accurate and safe before I go carry out that plan. Does that address your, your question to some degree? I'll see if they have a response. I do have another question as well that came in. Um, okay. Yeah, he thumbed it up, so I think so. Yeah. Um, so the other question was, on average, how long does it take to see a return on investment after integrating Gen AI into a manufacturing environment? So what's the, the ROI, would you, could you say? Um, I'm probably not in the best position to to comment on that. In fact, a lot of these systems are so new. They're in the implementation phases, the testing phases. But for the systems that I have worked with and working on, um, we're looking at roughly three months for implementation. Um, and six to nine months for starting to see real value out of them with within the company now return on that investment i'm not sure i don't know how much value you gain from having a worker that you would take you know three weeks to solve a failure suddenly be able to solve it in a single trip in a single day um that's really specific to your industry but it does sound like they're there certainly is going to be a, in all likelihood, a good time savings once everything is up and running and trained and so forth. Right. It sounds like I mean, there will be a good time savings very quickly out of the gate. You'll start seeing improvements, you know, the month of deployment, and then we'll only improve from there. Sounds good. What other questions do folks have? I have a few more that I can ask as well, but uh, let's let the, the audience uh, from our from our morning session that I can ask. But um, let's see what the current audience has on their mind. All right. Um, how much data is needed to train and retrain in generative AI for SSM? In some areas, data is very expensive to get, and does SSM do one-shot training? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, so SSMs are generally built on top of existing foundational models. Um, so they technically don't need any real additional information to start working. The value in them comes from connecting them to your industrial data sets 
so that they can answer reliably or so that they can perform very specific actions that are needed within your systems. Um, so an SSM could be created with no data and just from an existing heuristic or an algorithm. It could be created from a single document that is a manual for a piece of equipment that you own. Or an SSM could be created from an existing ML model for predictive maintenance that you already have and have already trained. The generative AI component can come from foundational models that already exist. There are dozens of, of open source options uh, in the world right now that actually perform just as well as GPT, especially for these industrial purposes. Um, where, like someone mentioned before, the creativity is not needed and the reliability is more important. So I'm willing to give up a billion parameters if it ensures that my model may not sound like a very convincing human, but does always give me the right answer. Um, and that said, these SSMs can still do one-shot learning depending on your use case and the type of data you want you want it to learn. So even in industries where where data and knowledge and information are expensive, um, you can still set up an SSM and you can still get these systems off the ground. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, manufacturing environments often involve variations, anomalies, or marginal cases that the models may not have encountered during their training. How to ensure that the gener generative AI can handle such situations reliably in the long run? Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's a very common issue. Um, I've seen a lot of companies try and set up predictive maintenance systems where they end up just creating um, anomaly detection systems. And what I mean there is they set up a system that uses a variational autoencoder or some other AI model to sit there and watch the data, the live data streams, and raise an alarm every time those data streams stray outside the normal range. Um, generally, what their failure is, is that this is going to lead to a lot of false alarms. It's going to lead to your engineers running around trying to basically diagnose every single one of those. To go a step further into predictive maintenance and fault prediction is often very challenging. And that's because of what you just said. There's a lot of edge cases. There's a lot of failures that don't happen often, especially in industrial systems, which are designed not to fail. So if I'm only getting a particular type of failure once every you know, five years, I can't train an AI model on that. I don't have that data set. I have maybe one example in my data set. But what I do have available is the engineers who designed that equipment. I have the reference books those engineers learn from on how to design that equipment. I have the manuals for that equipment. And all of that unstructured data, all of that knowledge can be leveraged by generative AI systems in order to start predicting those failures that aren't in the data set, that are the edge cases. Because now what it's doing is not learning from past examples. It's learning from knowledge and information and equations. In the same way that we as people would learn how to diagnose those issues. All right, excellent. Uh, are there additional questions? So I'll ask mine 
from earlier today about um, can you talk a little bit about AI data and the data security and how that is sort of maintained? Because I know that is is almost always a, a big issue for folks in the smart manufacturing space. Right. Um, yeah, that was a very good question earlier, and it's a very big topic of concern. Um, every company in the manufacturing space and actually most industrial companies in general are very protective of their data, their knowledge, and their process. Because that's what they generate value from, right? They make products, but their real value is the knowledge that was used to make those products, the information that's used to maintain those products and those processes. Um, and a big concern with using OpenAI or ChatGPT is the fact that you have to send your data to the cloud, to someone else's cloud, in order to access those models, those large language models. And that's really where SSMs come in and shine. And the fact that these SSMs are built on open source models that you can run in your own infrastructure if you trust your own cloud deployments or you can even run on your own hardware, right? Where ChatGPT requires specialized hardware, Falcon 7B, which is an open source language model, has a thousand times smaller almost. And it can run on, you know, a good desktop. There's models like Lamini or Vicuna, which are even smaller. They're in the 100 million range and can run on you know a decent laptop and so by using these specialist models um, you can actually have whole networks of ai systems running in wherever you need them to to feel secure in your data um, whether that is on an azure deployment that's specific to your company or whether that's on your local desktop in your manufacturing lab or whether that's on an air gapped laptop inside an r d facility um, really these systems can be deployed wherever is needed to make you feel secure excellent um so we've got time for another question or two or or Rashawn if there's a, any specific thing you'd like to emphasize or um, talk about the symposium again please please feel free yeah I mean I would love to go into detail on exactly how LLMs work and generative adversarial networks um, and how and where they break down um, I think understanding that really informs where you can apply them but I think I'll just leave you with, uh, please come to the KFIRST World Symposium. We will have industry leaders talking on exactly how they're doing this and how they're overcoming these problems. Um, it's going to be just a great set of talks for, for two whole days in, in California. Um, and that other than that, these systems are amazingly easy to get off the ground um and they really stand to change uh the, the whole landscape increasing productivity you know a hundredfold all right so excellent thank you Rashawn. thank you for the team at idomatic for all the work you put in to make this happen for us today and uh, thank you all the participants uh, and your questions. It's been very enlightening. Um, as I said, this session is recorded and we'll send out the recording, the presentations in about a week. We'll also uh, post it out on social media in a few places. So if you happen to miss the email, you might see it on LinkedIn or uh, YouTube where we where we post things for INEMI. So thanks again and I uh, appreciate your, your time. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks everybody. And thank you everyone for watching. Take Bye. care. Thank you.